Interested in real estate? How about wealth? Well, they go hand in hand. And here, you'll learn all about it. Welcome to Be The Bank, a podcast where we discuss and debate the topics centered around real estate investing. Your host, Justin Bogard, shares insights into investing in real estate to create real wealth and passive income for you and your family. He'll share stories of real estate investments done right, walk you through the process of owning a real estate note, and most importantly, educate you so you can be the bank. This is Be The Bank, brought to you by Bright Path Notes. Now, here's your host, Justin Bogard. Hello, this is episode number 24, brought to you by Bright Path Notes, and we are going to be discussing what we're going to be discussing with Richard Thornton, again, my partner in business crime. We're talking about what's going on in the, uh, as it pertains to like the Bitcoin industry and real estate and rentals and where you can park your money in a more secure and highly profitable way. Stay tuned. Richard, hello, my friend. You are not in your normal setting, are you? I am not. I am traveling. So we are trying this um, in, in, in mobile, and uh, we'll see how it goes. As you can see, I got a new setup behind me right now. I know, man. I didn't know you could play the piano. I mean, you're, you know, you're doing great. You know, uh, That's I what everybody thinks. Just... They think they, they thinks you know how to play the piano just because you have a piano, but you can just buy a piano just to have a piano. Oh, I can see, see you sitting back there, you yeah. know, on that couch, telling people about notes, eating bonbons. I mean, you know, this bonbons. is the life, dude. <laughs> yeah, this is the life. Yeah. Pop a bonbon, pop a bonbon. Yeah. yeah. For those of you just listening, we do record this on our YouTube channel, the Bright Path Notes YouTube channel, so you can go check that out. Unfortunately, yeah. Unfortunately, uh, you yes. don't have to. You can just listen. We prefer you just to listen. You don't have to look at us. It's not not that big a deal. But anyways, I'm using a virtual background. That's why Richard's teasing me a little bit. I'm teasing him because he's in a different location. So, anyways, Richard, how are you, and where are you at? Great. I'm in San Luis Obispo, California. I'm working my way down the coast, down Highway One. Um, it's a very circuitous route if you've ever taken it, and, but it's gorgeous. The whole coastline would take you usually four hours to uh, drive the straight shot down the valley. It takes you 12 hours to go down the coast. So that tells you how um, twisty <laughs> and turny the road is. Nice. And you're doing this mm -hmm. in, uh, in a, an economical vehicle, or are you doing this like in your truck? <laughs> <laughs> Well, I'm not driving the Bentley, if that's what you're asking. No. <laughs> yeah. um, <laughs> just, uh, you know, just my regular old Toyota. That's that's all I need, thanks. <laughs> right on. So, Richard, uh, you read an interesting article recently about um, the Bitcoin slash, uh, you know, digital currency industry. And I wanted you to talk about that a little bit and, and let's hear about what's going on. Well, it's just a lot about what's going on with FTX and it, its whole bankruptcy. Um, I mean, it's a large enough group um, so that it is taking uh, a lot of the financial world down with it. Uh, it it owes its, you know, they had dis disintermediation. Um, yeah. For those of you who don't know what that is, that's a it's a banking term, and it's when all of the um, depositors all of a sudden want their money out at once. And the bank can't do that because they have they can't uh, pay it out because they put it in different investments and that's how they that's how they yeah. make money. So um, it has been disintermediated. It is uh, now uh, officially bankrupt. They have over 130 subsidiaries, um, and the fallout is supposed to be amazing in terms of uh, the ripple effect that we're going to have here. Um, if you're an investor um, and you invest in anything crypto i'm sorry um <laughs> yeah. you may be you may be money up and and i hope i hope you are but um yeah we're going to be feeling the, rip, the ripple effects with all the different subsidiaries that they own here for quite a while wow okay so this is the cryptocurrency market uh, i'm not in crypto are you in crypto <clears throat> i am not i've looked at it several times and i've just never been able to get comfortable with it. I know a number of our other note brothers and sisters are, 
Um, but fortunately, from what I can tell, they're all in it in sort of what I would call dabbling fashions. Yeah. And they've got a couple thousand here and a couple thousand there. Right. Um, it's not their entire nest egg. It's just uh, they're sampling it to see see what's going on. Yeah. And unfortunately, what this is going to do, this is going to upset the banking world and everything else. And that's how it's going to start to affect our world. Okay. Explain that. Well, uh, I mean, a lot of people um, took out loans to put money into crypto. And a lot of uh, these crypto uh, groups um, have huge lending lines and things like that. Um, and now they're all going belly up. So um, the banks are going to be short money um, or short to they have got some big loans to, to work out here. And we're not talking about small dollars. We're talking about you know billions and billions of dollars. So um, that's going to affect them, the banking world, and our world. Okay. So what's going on in real estate right now? Are you seeing prices in California uh, as far as coming down aggressively, coming down moderately, or are they staying about the same? Yeah. So I um, looked at this. This is Bay Area. Um, mm -hmm. It's interesting. With Act, just yesterday I looked at a. Redfin report, a Zillow report, and one other. And I think the consensus is that real estate prices have dropped about 3%. So okay. that's, that's not a lot. That's a drop, no. but there's, you know, it's still, still starting to sag. Right. So in this Midwest market here in Indiana, we've seen prices go down. I don't know what the exact percentage is, but I, what it feels like to me is it's not a big drop either. It may be a few percent. Um, just because they're trying to correct things from when we talked about last time and then on our mm -hmm. broadcast that we did monthly in our November broadcast, we talked about how uh, we're in a correcting market in most markets. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Some are more correcting than others because some are more overinflated than others. <clears throat> right. So I see things calming down. We do see a lot more, and I mean a lot more, uh, opportunities for seller financing. We have been approached, you and I have been approached uh, many times during the week. And continue to be approached about how do you create a seller finance note? How can I sell that note once I create it? And what are the best uh, attributes to put in this note for someone like you to buy in the secondary market? Right. So that's been a conversation of topic that's been happening uh, pretty regularly. I, I'd almost say daily, but it's not quite daily, but it's definitely several times a week I'm having that conversation with somebody. And they're usually a real estate investor, like a wholesaler or a fix and flipper uh, that's got themselves into a situation where they can't sell it on the MLS within a few days like they were used to about a year ago, right? Right, right. And I'm really looking forward to, the, well, let's call it a, somewhat of a market correction here because it makes it mm -hmm. um, better for our notes. Um, right. We can buy at values that uh, I think are a little bit more secure. Not mm -hmm. that we weren't buying anything that wasn't, but most of the stuff that we're buying is 50% loan to value. So it can it could take quite a fall and we'd still be fine. Um, right. But... Um, yeah, I think we're going to see more and more, uh, again, with, with all of the um, uh, disruptions in the market, I think the stability that notes offer uh, will be welcome to a lot of people. And you know, I think the rising interest rate helps as well, right? The, the rising interest rate is up to, I don't know what it is because I haven't looked at it actually a week because I've always seen it over 7%. I'm not sure if it's gotten mm -hmm. up higher than that or lower than that today as of right now as we're recording this, I think it's it's around seven percent, plus or minus thirty bips maybe. Yeah, I think I looked um, yesterday and it was six point eight seven. That's what my guys were quoting me. So that's right there. Yeah. So it was, you know, a few years ago, as we've talked about before, it was down to three percent and sometimes below three percent, depending on what you're getting, like maybe a fifteen year or maybe some sort of unique arm that was a lower rate. But <clears throat> traditionally, it's been up about it's up about three and a half percent from when it was. Mm -hmm. uh, at its at its lowest point, <clears throat> and so that changes mm -hmm. our market a little bit too, to where we're seeing uh, more high balance loans at higher rates than what we're used to seeing. Like we're used to seeing them at two, three, four percent, five percent interest rates, and now they're six, seven, eight percent, and even mm -hmm. balances over two hundred thousand uh, dollars. So it's a very interesting time right now. It's a very good time to be in seller financing and creating seller finance notes and buying seller finance paper as well that isn't bank originated. Nothing wrong with bank originated notes. It's just this is a really unique time to where you can take advantage of having a very strong investment, like Richard said before, 
you can be in a pretty low pennies, not pennies on the dollar, <clears throat> be pretty low from 70 to 50% of as is value of the home. The borrower has a significant down payment. Let's say that lowers at 20%, and then you're getting it uh, at a discount as well. And you could be getting that discount uh, for various different reasons. Uh, it could be interest rate might be too low from, from previous years when they created these notes. Uh, the interest, uh, the term might be extended too long for a short note. Uh, I often have this analogy with people where they'll create seller finance paper on very low balance loans. Let's say $30,000, $40,000 loan, Not, nothing super high balance. And they'll write uh, a moderate interest rate, let's say 6 or 7%, and then they'll stretch the term out 30 years. <laughs> and what right. that does is it lowers the monthly payment so much to where the borrower really doesn't make a dent. And there's a ton of interest up front, which is good for the investor. If they plan on holding it for a very long time, 20, 30 years, but if they're trying to sell that paper, that is going to be discounted very heavily because of the time value of money theory to where you're trying to uh, buy something that's 30 years out and you see that the term is so uh, small and insignificant as far as the loan amount versus the term, it just becomes a problem for the one selling the note. And that's why sometimes our discounts are so big because we have to, we have to play that time value of money theory. Hey Justin, what's your th what's your thought about some of the reperforming notes that we're starting to see right now? I'm pretty impressed. Um, I had I didn't have to say I had my reservations. I was being optimistic about the reperforming loans when we knew these were coming through uh, during the COVID forbearance period. We knew those loans would be reperforming strongly, reperforming because we kept seeing the stats every month on Black Knight Financial data. Going from you know forty percent of them were reperforming to fifty percent, sixty, seventy, eighty. Now this mid eighty percent of all those loans that were in forbearance are now reperforming, mm -hmm. and they are performing um, at, a, at a good clip. Real estate prices really haven't dropped that much to affect their equity and the borrower's equity. They actually actually rose quite a bit, and then it's, it's kind of deflated back down to what normal is. So they they have a lot of good equity in there, so it's easy for them to refinance if they want or if they keep the same loan. They're just paying like steady Eddie. So we haven't seen uh, very much default rates actually since mm -hmm. then. And mm -hmm. so these reperforming loans that we are seeing on the market today, they look like they have a good 10 to 14-month uh, pay history of showing just consistent on-time payments. And so those reperforming loans are very strong. And you get them at a, just a little bit of a clip lower than a performing note as far as a discount. And so it's a really good note to invest in. And so that's what we're looking at a lot right now. So what about the quality of reperforming paper now as opposed to what came out of the recession? Well, we've talked about that before on this. I'm not sure if it was this podcast or the one before, Richard, and we, we touched on this, and I'm glad that you brought it up because it needs to be talked about again. The difference between a reperformer back in the Great Recession was mortgages were underwater. So a reperforming note was, was already forgiven a lot of principal balance uh, mm -hmm. to get them to where they were their mortgage payment or their mortgage loan amount was lower than the as is value of the home. <clears throat> so today we have a lot more equity and we didn't really lose any equity over this COVID stuff per se. So now their mortgage balance just stays the same and they're just reperforming. So the fact that they have equity in it and the fact mm -hmm. that they are reperforming, uh, mm -hmm. it was really no fault of their own. It was just a COVID situation and we all were affected by it in one way, shape or form. So it wasn't to their own fault why they were going through forbearance. More than likely, it was just because of you know the circumstances around them with job losses because people were not going to work and just you know other facets that we've all lived through the past couple of years. Yeah, I think it's also significant that post recession, um, a lot of people didn't have jobs that they could go back to. Uh, was it just, there just wasn't sure. that much employment there. Now we've still got a three point six percent unemployment rate. <clears throat> Um, everybody's clamoring to find more workers. So it's very easy to get back into a job, get back into the job that you had before. Um, yeah. So I just think it makes the reforming, reperforming market just a whole lot stronger. And I'm, I'm really um, excited about buying into those. Now, one thing that we have to note, and this is uh, perhaps a good segue for us, is that a lot of these reperforming notes are going to be larger than we um, usually mm -hmm. look at. Um, Correct. Because you've got a lot of middle, middle America. A lot of middle, middle yeah. America wasn't affected by the recession. Um, it was more or less the fringes. Uh, in this case, though, you've got, when I say middle America, I mean houses that are anywhere from one hundred and twenty to $350,000. Right. A lot of our individual note buyers 
won't be able to handle those kind of balances. But in our fund, we will be able to. You want to talk about that a little bit? Yeah, so we have a fund that we are starting, and we've mentioned this a few times. We're in the process of getting all of our paperwork finalized, and that fund gives out investors a certain rate of return depending on the investment amount that the uh, the investor pledges to the fund. And that fund is a debt fund. It's it's basically going to go out and buy performing, reperforming, and some non-performing loans for the purposes of getting cash flow and getting loans reperforming, and then cashing out of them by uh, selling those assets uh, before the fund sunsets. And so it's a pretty simple fund. It's nothing really overly complicated about it. It's pretty secure as far as the uh, investment that is being made is on you know, debt on properties, which ultimately is the real property that is being securitized to that loan. And so that's what we have going for us. And so this is the type of stuff that we're going to be investing and buying in. And so, like you said, it's a good opportunity for us to take a lot more capital to buy these these middle band price homes, which which is going to be a great opportunity for us uh, to get and hold in in our in our fund. Right. So I need to offer just a little bit of disclaimer there. What Justin just said is not financial advice. Um, we're right. already telling you about something we're doing, um, and no no uh, guarantee will be given in terms of any returns. But um, yeah, we're we're very excited about it. Yeah, it's as far as the investors are concerned, it's pretty much set it and forget it. Um, yep. Very passive, and I think very much market rate when we finally. I'm not going to discuss rates at the moment, but I think it's very competitive for what you're going to see out there in the market, especially given the stability that it offers. Yeah, investors have a couple different options once they get <clears throat> into the real estate world, right? They can invest in traditional real estate. They can get their hands dirty. They can be a fix and flipper. They can go out and be a landlord as well and have rental properties. And they'll be in the process of dealing with tenants and toilets and trash and those things that Richard and I really don't like to get into. You have wholesalers that you can get to wholesalers to where you get properties under contract and you resell them to other people. Uh, and then you have the note business as well. So all these things are active investing. Uh, it's where you can make more money, obviously, and you can get yourself trained and, and go through the processes of that. And, and then you can run a business with this as well. You can leverage your retirement account and stuff as well. And then the other aspect of this is investors that really have full-time jobs or professionals. Uh, they may be licensed professionals and they have their own businesses. And they just don't have the extra time to dedicate towards being an active investor in real estate because it does take a lot of time, as Richard and I both have discovered as we both are active real estate investors and we both have been active traditional real estate investors and now we're both active uh, note investors. And so it is a full-time job for us and that's what we do. So most people like the idea of like, hey, I like these things. I like the security of what we're getting, uh, except I just don't have time to go out and find it. I don't have time to go out and do it. I don't have time to go out and manage it, but I do like the, the rate of return that I would get and being a very passive investor. And this is where the fund kind of solves a lot of people's problems. And so this is why a big reason why we are setting up the fund. Yeah, and I think Ty, I think you you just brushed on something that's very important. Um, a lot of people that we know uh, who are note investors are very part time, meaning they've got a day job, um, they yeah. like notes, they like investing in notes. Um, I've had a number of uh, just regular active note investors come to me when we started to mention this at the expo and places like that. Come to me and say, look. I really want in because um, it's time consuming to invest in yes. notes um, and uh, they've got day jobs um, and they want to know their money's working for them. So that's what they're doing. And, uh, uh, you know, just because you are, you have a couple of active note investments doesn't mean you can't put it, put away you know, whatever you want uh, into the fund. Right. The, our min minimum is going to be $25,000, but there are step ups for those who, will uh, provide more funds. Yeah. So you brought up a, something that just jogged into my, into my memory bank here. And those uh, investors that, you know, aren't as want to be as active, th there's a lot more of them out there, right? There's a lot more of them that we've run into. Like you said, we've mm -hmm. talked to them at different conferences recently, and we've talked to them, you know, just through our daily interactions with different, different folks and stuff. And so it's, it wasn't surprising to hear the people that were kind of really interested in wanting to find out more once this actually goes live, which, which it should be pretty soon, and soon as relative, right? A few weeks to a month, really by the time we're recording this. And so it's really nice to hear that investors are able to, uh, 
understand how they can diversify their portfolio. We still have investors that invest in notes that are also in the stock market. We have investors oh, yeah, right. that also invest in, in the cryptocurrency. We have investors that do um, different sort of investing um, and they like to diversify their money. And so the best fit for this fund and for those that want to diversify their money in a different, in a different segment uh, so they can have a certain percentage of their money here, a certain percentage of their money there, and a certain percentage of their money in these really passive investments like this. They're all kind of passive to them, but they kind of they kind of directing their their investment different ways. So those are the those are the investors that are really turned on by this idea. Agreed. Yeah. Agreed. <laughs> agreed. Right. Not not much of a response there, but agreed. It's you, you said it well. Yeah. So diversification, I guess, is where I'm getting at. So it's it's mm -hmm. not it's not recommended by anyone that is that knows anything about uh, how to grow your wealth to say don't don't put all your eggs in one basket, uh, so to speak. Within a basket, like within note investing, there are many different verticals to go into. Believe it or not, it is a niche business that has more niche verticals inside of it, which which can be pretty interesting. And that's the stuff that Richard and I kind of live in every day. Uh, but for the average investor, it's good to have, you know, your money tied up, a chunk of your money here, a chunk of your money there, a chunk of money, you know, over here. So funds are a great way to diversify your money. Exactly. Exactly. Right. That, so that, so if you invest in a fund, you can buy a nice piano like you've got and everything. Like yes, we can. Yeah. That's right. That's right. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yeah, as they say in the business, your first money in, first money out. So it's kind of the best seat to be in when you're investing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So. All right, Richard, that is about all the time we have for this episode today. This is episode number 24 brought to you by Bright Path Notes. And we will catch you on the next episode. Very good. Good to see you. All right, see you guys. Bye. Thanks for listening to Be The Bank. We hope you learned something from today's show. If you enjoyed this episode, please rate and review us. Plus, check out our Bright Path Notes channel on YouTube and follow us on Facebook and Twitter at Be The Bank and on Instagram at Be The Bank Podcast. Be The Bank is sponsored by Bright Path Notes. Thanks again for listening.